Chris the Bergeron zone. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Um, is uh, documentation, um, back to there, is the, is the documentation. Um, one of the, uh, well, I'll call it an, un and by the way, we're going to take all questions at the end. Um, one of the unintended consequences of Jimmo, when you read these regulations, is that they tightened everything up, not just for the Jimmo cases, but for all cases, but for all cases. So that, for example, in a skilled nursing facility, um, if, and, and it may be that you're doing this now, in a skilled nursing facility, after a skilled, uh, there is a skilled nursing event where the skilled nurse is there, in the notes, there needs to be uh, a history go coming up to that event, right? Uh, a discussion of what happened, right? The, what, what, the, what your skilled nurse did and what the response was from the patient. The plan for the next visit, for the next skilled visit to that patient or the next skilled event if it's happening in the nursing home. And the, re and the reason why another skilled event is still necessary or another, another, another giving of skilled care is necessary based on the patient's condition after, that, after the event that just occurred uh, and any other relevant characteristics. So you're, you're seeing um, this really demand by Medicare it, for the first time in their manuals for a level of documentation that wasn't there before. Now I know as Matt is going to tell you, right, well, you know, if you, were being, if you were being careful, that's the kind of documentation you would have provided before. Well, we're just telling you though, it's actually in the manual now. So that to the extent that you're not providing that kind of documentation, there's a good chance that you could get knocked off, right? So you need, you need to be aware of that. And that's a piece of these presentations that we weren't kind of expecting to do until we actually read the changes to the policy manual. Um, and obviously the reasons for you, for you folks are, and the reason why when I've talked to nursing home administrators, they've been kind of cons you know, reticent to, to kind of take the leap regarding GEMO, right? Is the last thing you need is to have done all of these cases and then you get that magic notice from Medicare, send us cases A, B, C, D, and E for review, and you send them in and they say, well, sorry, on A, B, and C, we don't think we should have paid you. Right? And of course, in the K Medicare case, it doesn't mean they actually have to go chase you for the money. They just, cut, they just reduce your check for that month. Right? So I, we realize that there is that concern. There is that big administrative concern. And you know, we've talked to Mary McKenna about it. The ombudsman realized that. So we need to be trying to figure out how we can work with you to help overcome that. Because if we can overcome it, then at least as far as my patients are concerned, my patients, as far as my clients are concerned, the many, I would say 90% of my clients are elders who are either worried about getting Alzheimer's or they've got it or their mother has it or their father's, father has it. As we all kind of know, what elder lawyers do basically is they work with families who have the disease which isn't covered by Medicare. Right? As I always say, to, you know, I just did this blog post and I said, so explain to me the difference between the person who has cancer, for which Medicare will pay the chemo and will pay the operations and the, you know, the sky's the limit, right? But if your patient has Alzheimer's, isn't that, a vet, isn't that really a disease too, right? Try to get any help for Alzheimer's. Medicare doesn't cover it, right? So the, the, the potential for this case in terms of really helping a lot of my folks is really significant, which is one of the reasons why we wanted all of you folks to be here. So, because you're obviously, and, you're, and the administrators are obviously nervous about this stuff, I asked Matt to talk about this because Matt, Matt's had that experience representing clients where Medicare shows up and they're auditing. And as Matt has pointed out, when the, when the Medicare auditors show up, even if they've come because of Jimmo, they're not just looking at Jimmo, right? They're just, they're there to audit and they're going to audit to make sure that everything that they care about, federally relevant regulations, is being complied with. So I wanted Matt briefly to talk about those federally relevant regulations. Matt Fisher. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as Arthur said, I'm going to talk about compliance for a little bit. Just because, you know, as you, you would expect, if you're going to try and push the envelope a little bit on the GIMO front, and it looks like you're starting to ask for payment and coverage beyond what other uh, facilities are doing currently, 
you'd expect that that would might start raising some red flags with your local with the local contractor and with you know with Medicare paying in general so before you'd want to go down that road you in my view you'd want to clearly make sure that you've got a full compliance plan in place so I guess maybe the first question I'd ask for everyone here is who does have a compliance plan so that's one that's good so that's I, I saw <laughs> one hand in, in, a, in a minute you'll see why that's actually to me very concerning so as Arthur said my focus in healthcare is on regulatory and compliance so that means I'm looking at the Medicare regulations looking at the relationships between providers so it could be you know your skilled nursing facility and your met your physician medical director or relationships with the hospitals because from the government point of view they're very concerned about referral relationships and when there is a financial relationship between facilities and providers because they're concerned that you know one facility is going to say oh you know you send me some some additional patients we'll send some back or you know we'll give you somewhat of a discount just to help to help kind of smooth the process along you know Generally in business, that's a fairly typical type of arrangement where you, you know, to encourage people to come to you, you're going to offer them something. But in healthcare, that's actually going to be a problem. So from the compliance perspective, you need policies and procedures in place that are really looking at all areas of your operation. Uh, you know, from human resources to, um, you know, just your patient interactions. You know, as Arthur was mentioning, the documentation now under with the clarifications to the, to the manuals because of GMO, it's really emphasizing that they want full and complete documentation. So you're not actually left in the dark in terms of what should be done. There is actually guidance available from the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services. That's been out since, since about 2000. And the purpose of those is to give you a comprehensive overview of what the government would be looking for if they come in and start auditing and also just you know looking for the, these policies and procedures that are really going to help minimize potential fraud waste and abuse which are the three hallmarks of what the government's concerned about so again why is compliance important um, again if you're pushing the envelope and you're asking seeking uh, longer reimbursement or payment by Medicare it's going to f get flagged by the uh, contractors because they're always looking for the outliers and the outliers are obviously going to be the ones who are trying to collect more reimbursement than everyone else so if you're looking again so if clearly if you're looking at the GMO and um, standards or clarification as CMS has been uh, phrasing it and trying to get the, that full coverage to which all your patients may be entitled then it's going to uh, po likely pop up. But again, I think it, and Arthur had mentioned this, the, there's kind of a detailed point about the GMO standard. It's really only affecting one element. You still need to meet all the other necessities of is skill care actually required? Have they met the prerequisites for being able to come into the facility uh, for coverage? But it, you know, so GMO is impacting whether, you know, whether or not the services can continue and how the patient's receiving it. It's not impacting the entire spectrum it's the, really that one element but again from the compliance perspective um, this is a somewhat little noticed but extremely important uh, section from the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare passed in 2010 there is a provision in its section 6102 of the Affordable Care Act mandates skilled nursing facilities as a condition of participation to have a full compliance plan in place that went into effect 36 months after passage of the law, so that means it became effective March of 2013. CMS has not published regulations or even put out proposed regulations to implement it, but if you read the letter of the law, every skilled nursing facility must have a compliance plan in place now. And that's compliance with what? So it, the statute actually lays out seven elements of what, the com of what should be going into the compliance plan. So there should be written policies and procedures, and again, those, the scope of those policies and procedures are going to, for now, I would suggest looking at that uh, guidance from the OIG. And, that, and again, that's going to be covering the full scope of your operations. The next, the next element is you're going to need a compliance officer. And the compliance officer is obviously responsible for administering the policies and procedures, overseeing the program, most likely being the uh, main person for reports of potential issues that 
uh, arise, whether it be reported by an employee or a patient or a family member. Um, it's also a good practice to have a compliance committee working with that compliance officer. You know, one person can't do it alone, and if you ha have a committee kind of drawing from all areas of your operations, it, you know, my experience, that just helps with a better functioning uh, program. The next element is training and education. Clearly, you can't just, you know, have, you know, go onto the internet or have someone write policies and policies for you and put them in place. If no one knows about them, then it's, in, you know, in my view, the same as not having anything there. So you actually need to then, you know, work on educating your workforce and actually training them on what appropriate behaviors are. Um, next are effective lines of communication. Um, you know, a typical, for example, a typical piece of a good compliance plan is that there can be an anonymous tip line. Uh, you know, so that way, if someone suspects or is worried about particular activities are going on, they can call in and say, "Hey, you know, I saw um, this going on. I think this might be violating our policies, or I think this might not be allowed under Medicare." And then that allows an investigation to to occur, which kind of then leads into the next element, which is that you need to enforce the compliance plan. Uh, you can't just have it there. You actually need to regularly monitor it, and then if, you, if a violation is found, enforce, you know, one, correct the violation, but then discipline where, ne where necessary and appropriate. Um, the sixth point, which I actually just kind of touched upon, is monitoring and auditing the compliance plan. Um, you know, this goes into kind of the point that I have under the second bullet, which is you need to be, pr you should be performing a risk assessment. You can't, again, you can't just have these policies and procedures in place, but you actually need to be continually going through and looking at, you know, is it effective as written? Are people following it? Because it can be a, you know, it should be a living, breathing uh, plan. It shouldn't just be static where you write it uh, up front and then never think about it again. But, it, you know, I would suggest yearly go, go through, look at it, Make sure, you know, see where there might be problems where people can't necessarily follow all of it, and, you know, you can make adjustments where appropriate. And then finally, respond to offenses. So again, you know, something happens, go through and correct it. And in terms of identifying uh, where there are areas of particular concern, the Office and the Inspector General very helpfully every year publishes their work plan. And in their work plan, they identify their areas of concern broken part by types of providers covered by Medicare. You know, so obviously hospitals, physicians, and skilled nursing facilities, uh, durable medical equipment, but you know, in particular I'd suggest you, know, you can go to the section on skilled nursing facilities and that way you can actually see what, what investigations or areas has the OIJ been looking at in the past that are still going on, what new areas are that are being considered, and I would suggest that if as the general public and the broader public and facilities actually become educated about GMO like you all are, you all are today, I would expect that that might actually start a, that issue might start popping up on the OIG's work plan because they'll be concerned that, um, you know, care might be trying to get extended beyond what is actually medically necessary. Um, you know, because again, one other key point about GMO is there's still the, what is it, the 180 day cap? 100 day cap. You know, just because they've clarified the standard that it doesn't have to be improvement, but it can be improving, maintaining, or slow, slowing the deterioration, there's still that end point. You can't go beyond that. And CMS has actually been clear on that point. 